starting life at de Havilland in the 1950s as the DH-121, the Hawker Sidley Trident, as she became known, made her maiden flight on January the 9th, 1962. Two years later, passengers were able to enjoy this 600 mile an hour response to BEA's need for a fast, short-haul jetliner. It was in many ways a revolutionary aircraft. The world's first trijet design with its three Rolls-Royce Spey engines clustered around the tail permitted a very clean and efficient wing for high-speed cruising, and its pioneering automatic landing system was to herald a new era in passenger aviation. My interest in the Trident really stems from my childhood days. Uh, my father used to take me up to Heathrow to plane spot and uh, we'd sit on top of the Queen's building and we'd watch these beautiful, noisy, dirty British Tridents taking off and landing. And I made up my mind at a very early age that I really wanted to own my own Trident. And of course, uh, it's, it's a dream come true. And, and thanks to Russell here, it's, it's uh, been rewired and it's a live cockpit and um, it's wonderful, really. Sadly, there are very few surviving Tridents and no airworthy examples flying anywhere in the world. Andrew Lee, however, has lovingly restored the flight deck of a Trident 3B which can be seen at the Farnborough Air Sciences Museum. More often not when you go to museums, when people see an aeroplane, it's very much dead. But we wanted to make it a live cockpit. So we really wanted to make it look as realistic as possible, with uh, crew jackets hanging up and load chutes and aircraft manuals. Uh, we wanted the people to sort of imagine that it's just prepared for service and ready to go. It does bring an, an extra um an extra bit of life to it. I mean, it, there's no doubt about it. It's to see something sort of sitting there doing nothing. It, it gets a bit stale. So uh, it's definitely been been noted by by everyone who comes around here that uh, we got, have got everything working on it. For example, the CWS that works. Uh, we have uh, the stick shaker that works, and the stall warning horn, and the engine fire bell. I mean, since the sad events of, of September 11th, flight deck visits are no longer possible, and you know it's a very sad situation. So, for children visiting the museum, it's quite a, an event to actually be able to get in the cockpit and, above all, sit in the captain's seat and flick a few switches. It gives a lot of pleasure, especially to former pilots and ground engineers, and they come on board and they say, "Oh, I used to work on that. That was a real devil to get at, you know. Or, you know, it was, it was a good airplane to fly." Yeah, they've all got their stories. They've all got their stories. <laughs> yeah. 20 years since I've sat in the flight deck of the Deer Trident. Ah, I used to sit over there, but I'm quite happy to sit here. This was an amazing airliner, this. Very, very quick, very beautiful to fly. And uh, it was a wonderful 12 years I spent in command of one of these. The Trident had a remarkable descent capability of over 10,000 feet per minute, which in layman's terms is around 120 miles an hour. This was only possible because it was certified to use reverse thrust while still in the air. Reverse thrust is opening some big clamshell doors at the back of the engine, so the engine doesn't go into reverse, but what happens is the air, the, the, the jet efflux is being deflected forwards. and. Uh, the advantage of that was that on the occasions where the air traffic control kept you high, I had an occasion going into Geneva where this was the case, and we had to descend at the last minute quite quickly. And you could select reverse thrust with these levers here, like that. That's full reverse thrust on the two pod engines. And at 20,000 feet, I pointed out to my two gallant pilots, we had just under two minutes to the ground at this rate of descent. The engineer, had to get the cabin going down quickly because otherwise the aircraft could overtake the cabin because the pressure outside uh, is now greater than inside and so that's that's not the way it's designed and it, that would blow a valve and it, so the the guy on the panel the engineers panel had to anticipate this high rate of descent and I'd get him to start descending the cabin before we got the clearance to descend otherwise that would happen but um, as I say, it was very rarely used and not something that was uh, uh, a good idea because as I say, you had to watch, I mean, 10,000 feet a minute rate of descent is, is very quick. And uh, but that's what the airplane could do. The Trident Preservation Society have also restored a complete Trident 3 at Heathrow, which is due to be exhibited at the Manchester Airport Aviation Park.
We've had a lot of crew, ex-crew on the aircraft, and there's a, a, a big fondness for the aircraft in BA. I don't know why, I mean, everyone complains about the noise of the Trident, you know, and the fuel economy of it, but it's a very, very popular aeroplane. And I mean, the people who've donated to us uh, love Tridents for some mad reason like I do. I have a passion for aircraft anyway, and this is, this is just an example of the sort of era when, when, when British aviation was great. This aeroplane is about the middle of the group of 26 that were built of the Trident III, which was the last of the Tridents developed from the original Trident I. It's also the best, uh, carried the most passengers, uh, but it didn't have anything particularly new on it, apart from the fact that it was sometimes known as the only five-engine aeroplane because you had the three main engines, they fitted a boost engine at the back, and of course the APU was a jet engine as well. I think we still talk about the Trident today for a number of reasons. Um, one, the, the aircraft is still an attractive looking aircraft. Um, it was a very attractive aircraft of its time. Um, it had very, very fine lines. Um, it was very aerodynamic. Um, it was a lovely looking aircraft. I can't give you the exact figures, but I myself have done over Mach 0.9 in one with the original development of the aeroplane. And it was as smooth as silk, it really was. Ha handling was good, uh, very easy. The main controllers being the elevators and the ailerons. This was known as the ram's horn for obvious reasons. And um, it was a very comfortable aeroplane to fly at all speeds. And this is why most people liked hand flying it as opposed to using the automatics. What made the Trident stand out were, were a couple of features. Um, the principal feature among that was its ability to land um, and do auto lands in, in fog conditions. The Trident was built from the outset for automatic landing in bad weather. And this Trident Mark 1C made the world's first auto flare and landing at Bedford on the 5th of March 1964. This is what the aeroplane was so great because it pioneered all the modern automatic landing equipment you have nowadays. You know, aeroplanes do it, oh, it's all there, ching, ching, ching. But somebody had to start it, and the Trident started it. The aeroplane is built, actually, in what is known as the triplex condition. In other words, it had three engines, it had three autopilots, it had three hydraulic systems, and whenever you did an automatic landing, you were, the autopilot was operating in triplex. The Smith's flight controller lies at the heart of the Trident auto land system. And this component would be used to select the various modes of operation that the auto land would be selected to by the flight crew. This would be supported by a number of computers that are located underneath the floor and which do the computations to enable the aircraft to do its auto land. The system had amplifiers and computers which monitored each other to ensure that there was operational integrity and that they were sound. Um, the way the system would actually operate it would actually take control of the flying controls down through the flight during the landing phase and would bring the aircraft down to land, including instigating a, a manoeuvre called a flare. On the Trident, that manoeuvre was carried out by the flying controls, automatically controlled by the computers. Before that, nobody could land if the visibility was less than 600 metres and the cloud base 200 feet. And in the winter at Heathrow and many other airfields around Europe, it was often worse than that. So it was costing the airline a great deal of money to divert. But after the pioneering work we did in this aeroplane, we, we could land in what they called Cat 3B landing and we could make an approach with the sky obscured, the visibility 75 metres and nobody else could do that in the world. Before we started work on this aircraft, it, it, it was tatty and smelly. Uh, the flight deck needed completely ripping out and restoring. Uh, the cabin, all the seats had to be, the covers removed, dry cleaned, uh, new carpets, but the bulk of the restoration was on the flight deck, which we find is the most important part of the Trident uh, because of its automatic landing capabilities uh, and its ram's horn style controls uh, and the moving mat display, which it has at the front, which is quite unique. They repainted ZK three years ago uh, into British European Airways colours. BA 
come up trumps for that. Over the last 10 years of working on this aircraft, I've been thoroughly enjoyed myself working with the other guys restoring this aircraft. I think it's a fitting tribute to the aircraft that it can go to Manchester Aero Park where the general public can enjoy the aircraft as much as I have. <laughs>